Good morning to you all, and on behalf of UNICEF, UNICEF, thank you so much for joining us in this very important week leading to the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, as you know, we are having an amazing panel of experts today to be discussing something that for UNICEF is going to be essential during this week in the discussion around the Sustainable Development Goals, is how these goals should be given a fair chance to every child starting with the support to early childhood development. This is why we have just had a, a meeting with uh, world experts on early childhood development and Dr. Shankov, Mr. Lake and Shakira have been part of that. In case, I don't know if they need introduction, but in case you don't know them um, by, uh, so far, I, let me introduce you to Dr. Jack Shankov, Director of the Center on the Developing Child at Harvard University. Of course, let me introduce you to our dear Executive Director of UNICEF, Mr. Anthony Lake. And in a few seconds, we are going to be introducing our UNICEF Global Goodwill Ambassador and Champion for Early Childhood Development, Shakira. For you to know, each of our speakers will make short remarks, and then we will open the floor to questions for about 15 minutes. But as you know, we are a bit tight on time because the noon brief has to start at noon. So... If uh, you allow me, uh, Mr. Lake. <laughs> yes, okay, okay, that's... Uh, we will respect the rules then. Mm, we will respect the rules. But, um, Tony, do you want to start? Sure, thank you. Um, um, I'm going to just... I'll be very brief, uh, and I want to get across a simple fact that I think can transform how we uh, work for children around the world uh, and how c which can affect millions, hundreds of millions of children's lives uh, and therefore their societies uh, and their families. Uh, and that fact is, uh, as Jack will tell you in more detail, that uh, when a child does not receive proper stimulation if from the earliest time of that child's life, the child's brain will not develop properly. Because every second, 1,000, every second, 1,000 of the cells in a child's brain are connecting. Uh, and whether those cells connect or not will make a huge difference for the rest of the child's life. We have known that this was true for quite a while when it comes to stimulation. Uh, and early education for the child's uh, brain. Uh, but we have learned more recently that if the child does not get proper nutrition, then the brain does not develop properly. And there are 160 million or so children who are around the world who are stunted, whose brains are not developing in the way they could have if they had gotten proper nutrition. That is 160 million is about a quarter of all the children under five around the world. And what that means is those child, children for the rest of their lives will not have the same cognitive capacity they could have if they'd simply gotten more uh, micronutrients. And what Jack and other scientists are finding is that when a child is subjected to violence or abuse, whether in the family or from living in conflict situations, that once again, the brain does not develop uh, as well as it could have. At a huge cost to that child, at a huge cost to the family of that child, and a huge cost to that uh, child's society. So this is a very big deal. It doesn't cost very much to provide uh, cheap micronutrients. It doesn't cost very much to persuade families uh, and communities to uh, prevent the abuse and violence against children. It doesn't cost very much for families to give children the stimulation they need so their brains will develop. Uh, and the return on those investments are huge. Again, uh, this is a very big deal, uh, and it is certainly one of the priorities for UNICEF uh, and many others, and you could hear it in the room this morning, of how dedicated everybody is to doing something uh, about this. And I'm glad there are so many of you here so that you can help us get the word out uh, that a lack of stimulation, abuse or violence, 
and a lack of nutrition affects a child's not only thinking capacity, but health uh, for the remainder uh, of her life. And Jack, perhaps you can explain why. <laughs> Jack, could you give me one second? I think perhaps if you have someone in there. I should talk fast before all the attention shifts. Yeah. Why don't you start? <laughs> so, so, um, so let me just do a little bit deeper dive. So um, for the fact that, that violence and poverty okay. and – Sorry. Wait a minute. <laughs> no no need to introduce you. It's okay. It's okay. Hello, <laughs> just describe it. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So we now – now with Shakira – the, the UNICEF champion for early childhood development has joined us, and uh, she's going to be listening to the main messages that Dr. Shankov has shared with us all this morning. Dr. Shankov, your turn. So, so the link between violence and poverty and other sources of stress, the link between that and not doing well in school, having more health problems, not living as long, that link is not new news. We've known about that for hundreds of years in every society. Um, what's new is that we're living through a revolution in neuroscience and molecular biology and genetics and epigenetics that is helping us answer the question of how does that happen? How does, how does that level of adversity and stress get into the body and lead to problems with learning? Um, and what, we're, what this new science is telling us is that literally early experiences are kind of built into the body. Um, they literally affect the development of the circuits of the brain. They affect the immune system's development. They affect the development of the cardiovascular system. Um, and so um, what's important about this, I think, from the public's point of view, is not that this is like another reason to care about poverty or to care about violence, but it's a new opportunity to think about what we might do differently to protect children from the long-term consequences of that because we know that – Protective, responsive environments build a very strong foundation in the brain for a lifelong prospect of, of effective learning and good health. And we know that toxic stress uh, literally creates a weak foundation. So it doesn't mean that everything's over after the age of three or the age of five, but it means that we have to work harder, we have to spend more money, um, it's more complicated. And we're never going to get as good an outcome as we would have gotten if we had done things right the first time, if we had prevented some of this disruption, if we had intervened earlier. Um, so this is about using a revolution in biology to address the roots of many of the major social problems that affect every country. It's about new ideas. It's about greater understanding. And as we talked about earlier in the session this morning, once you understand how literally the body creates biological memories that last for a lifetime, um, you can't just shrug your shoulders and walk away and say, well, you know, babies don't know what's going on. Um, children living in war zones when they're very young uh, don't really understand what's happening. They're not going to remember this. Um, the science is telling us um, they may not consciously remember it, but their body remembers it. It literally affects the development of the brain. It literally affects the development of other organ systems. And so that's the message, a new opportunity to think differently about how we might address these problems, and particularly by getting at their roots very early in life before a lot of these uh, problems develop. And uh, to give you a very concrete example, um, a very aggressive, difficult-to-control two-year-old is a big handful <laughs> for any family who has to deal with that problem but it's a lot easier to deal with an aggressive, out-of-control 2-year-old than an aggressive, out-of-control 12-year-old. And an aggressive, out-of-control 12-year-old is a lot easier than an aggressive, out-of-control 22-year-old or 32-year-old. And the reason is not just because people get stubborn or more complicated as they get older. It's because patterns of development and behavior can be set early on that did not have to be that way. I think that's the last thing I'll say. Uh, there's, for a long time, there used to be a, a debate in the scientific community and in the public about how much is something determined by genetics and how much is it determined by the environment. Um, that is no longer an interesting scientific question because 21st century science says you can't separate the two. We're all born with different genetic predispositions, but how our genetic 
makeup is expressed is literally influenced by the impact of experience. It actually turns genes on and turns genes off. It's really that striking and that kind of fundamental. And this is something that no scientist who studies this area disagrees with. So I'll stop there. There may be Can interesting I, questions to respond to. There. Or could I just summarize one of the points you made this morning, Jack? Is that it is not only the effect on the brain and the capacity of the child then to think uh, as an adult, but it also has an effect on whether or not the child will develop heart disease, whether the child will develop diabetes. Uh, it has a profound impact on the whole well-being of the child for the rest of that child's life. And I guess the last thing I'd say about this is that when, when what your grandmother could have told you and what science tells you end up in the same place, we know we have something powerful, right? So your grandmother would have said, well, if you get a good start in life, probably you'll have better prospects than if you get a bad start in life. That's kind of common sense. We now understand at the molecular level how that's true. Um, but the important take-home message here is that what happens early can really have a lifetime of impact, but it's never too late to intervene at a later age. This is not a completely deterministic life sentence. What it says is we're just making it harder. We're creating problems that we could have avoided if we had intervened earlier. So thank you so much, the Boshankov. And Shakira, on behalf of UNICEF, we cannot thank you more about your availability this week. You are coming here to New York to defend in front of all the global leaders how important it is to have the, the most executed children at the heart of the agenda of the new Sustainable Development Goals, but also to make sure that all we discuss this week is about how all of us can give a fair start in life to every child in the world. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I think what my colleagues will agree with me that we just came from a very productive meeting um, where we had some of the brightest minds uh, from both the, poli the public and the private sector. We had uh, Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan, uh, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, um, and we were discussing during almost uh, an hour and a half the importance and the urgency of investing in early childhood development strategies. I would like to share with you why I'm so passionate about um, ECD and why I advocate for it. Um, I've been working in education since I was 18, and since then I, uh, through my own foundation in Colombia, started to build schools in areas, um, in areas where there's extreme poverty and conflict and, and violence. And we've worked with children who belong to families that have been displaced by violence, families that have lost everything they had, basically the refugees in their own country. Um, and we have been able to impact 60,000 people, eliminated malnutrition um, in the children that, that, we, that we offered in education. Um, local banks, dis I'm sorry, local gangs disbanded from the area, and we were able to bring electricity and portable water and even pave roads in combination with the local government because this is how we work in, in, in our schools in Colombia with always partnering with the local government. So they do their part of the job. And we have been very successful bringing quality education to to thousands of kids in Colombia. However, not everything has been a path of roses. We've, we had um, tremendous difficulties in order to provide quality education. Um, it has been a process of trial and error. And we were at some point having a really hard time trying to keep kids in school because some of them had never received proper care, nutrition, and stimulation in those first five years of their lives. So they weren't prepared to learn and to absorb the information. Um, and we, that's when we realized that we were getting to these kids too late. And that's when I was introduced to uh, research on ECD and the astonishing advances in neuroscience that blew my mind. Uh, and that show how ECD programs affect the developing brain of a child. And, of course, 
from that moment on, that became a priority uh, to us in, in our foundation, and, and, we, and that made uh, all the difference in the world. It really did. Um, so I was, of course, fascinating, fascinated by all the, the, the striking uh, information that I was stumbling across, but also it was fascinating to me to see how investing in ECD actually amplifies to the rest of society. You know, because investing in ECD boosts economic growth, it offsets inequality, and it helps eliminate crime and violence. So it really, it really works. And it is, without a doubt, the most effective way to guarantee a more stable world, a more peaceful world, and a more prosperous world. But we need more commitment. And that's why we're here this week. And that's what we're here for uh, today. It's a matter of putting children at the center of the social and economic and political debate and their needs. Children's basic needs, such as care, nutrition, stimulation, need to be a priority, need to become a priority over any other human investment. And countries need to dedicate more of their G GDP spend Towards, in, in, towards ECD initiatives and towards ECD strategies all over the world. And also, the private sector needs to pick up where governments leave off. It's the only way. Private sector and public sector have to work together as a team because ECD is that kind of challenge that has to be met only, if, only through a joined up approach. Otherwise, we fail. Um, It is the most urgent thing that lies, the most urgent responsibility that lies within our hands. From an economic perspective, it is important, sure. It is very important because of all of these uh, points that we have been uh, exposing before. It boosts economic growth of nations, and of course we all want that. But take that to a human level. And the case becomes so much more stronger because money isn't everything in the end. But investing in our children and in the future of our society is. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you uh, uh, very much. Uh, on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association, uh, thank you for this uh, press conference. And I want to ask uh, Ms. Shakira, uh, as a Lebanese, oh, sorry, as a Colombian with a Lebanese root, <laughs> or as a UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador, uh, you are witnessing, like everybody, the crisis in Syria and the refugee uh, around in the countries around Syria and beyond. Uh, this is the worst place uh, in, on our planet for children nowadays. When you uh, please tell us uh, how do you think about this issue? What message uh, you want to uh, convey to the Pope who is coming in a few days here, to the world leaders who are coming here, uh, to just reduce the suffering of uh, the uh, Syrian uh, uh, children? And uh, would you mind telling us what song do you sing for your kids, um, Milan? And Isabel, I think. Uh, Sasha. Sasha, sorry. Yeah, Sasha. Sorry. Uh, uh, what is the song? And would you like it at some point to sing it for the Syrian children? Thank you. Uh, it, is, it is, without a doubt, one of the greatest humanitarian crises of our time. And the image of that little boy washed up on the shore is a tragic one and one that we shouldn't ignore and shouldn't forget. And it, should, and it should humanize the plight of the refugees because children should not pay the price of war and because all of us have a responsibility today and we cannot escape it. Not the leaders of the world and not us as civil society. We need to come together and we need to demand a just exit to this humanitarian crisis because 
the refugees deserve to have a home. And I know that there's a lot of racism underneath it all. And I know that there are also concerns. Every country has concerns about their own economies. But I, I only hope that sometime soon we can have a world where human needs and human rights rise above flags and borders and numbers and selfishness and racism. Because I'm sure it's not an easy uh, problem to resolve, but I'm also sure that nations coming together could find an intelligent way, an intelligent solution to this issue, this urgent issue. In the name of Aylan Kurdi and Galib Kurdi, those two boys who lost their lives. And the song, the song well, uh, every time I think of the Kurdi brothers, I, I think of the lyrics of that John Lennon song, Imagine. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. Why can't we share all the world? What's holding us back? Beautiful. Yes. I was hoping you would sing. <laughs> ah, you wanted me to sing. Just two bars, yeah. just two lines. I would sing. I'll probably sing yeah. it soon. Please, no, one, please. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> this is for the children of Syria and all the suffering children. Please. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. I hesitate to have words follow yes. that such a beautiful you should sing thing, too. but <laughs> I was playing air guitar behind you. <laughs> um, just to add a couple of numbers there. There are two million children in Sir inside Syria out of school. There are almost countless children outside Syria who have witnessed the most unspeakable horrors. And to bring it back to what we were discussing earlier, the effects on them of the youngest children of the development of their brains, on the older children who think it is somehow normal that you should hate people uh, simply because of their religion or their background, that unspeakable violence is just a normal thing that happens, how are they going to act when they grow up? All of this means that a generation from now, those same hatreds and that same conflict can be with us unless we do more to intervene in the lives of those children, including the very youngest, uh, for the sake of their future and for the sake of Syria. Hi, thank you. Um, Pamela Falk from CBS News. And first, wow, that, so thank you. Uh, the follow-up to Ali's question on migrants. You are singing in the bridge following Shakira the Pope. Um, what will you sing, and what is your message, since he is directing a certain message to the Latino community and migrants? And to Dr. Um, uh, Shankoff and, and Mr. Lake, what are you doing in this migrant crisis for, as UNICEF? I mean, I know you're doing a lot, but can you do more? Thank you. Well, I would like to sing, imagine. And um, I know that he, he defends the poor, and it's one of the, it's one of the, it's one of his plights. And, but we all know that violence, violence is the result of inequality. And inequality is the result of the lack of opportunities. And what better opportunity than education to all? That every child in the world has an opportunity to learn so they can be better prepared to enter school later on and to succeed in life when they become adults. Socially adjusted children grow into productive adults. And this is 
what that this is how it later on amplifies into the rest of society. So we cannot just be reactive. We have to be proactive. We cannot just look at the today look at today's great uh, greatest problems uh, individualistically, separately, as if they they were as, as if they weren't interrelated, as if they existed in a vacuum. We have to solve our greatest problems upon that cornerstone that should be education for all. Um, so that's what I would like to to say to the Pope as well, if I had the chance, because we do need more leaders to to take to make this issue their own. And he's one of the most heard voices in the world. And we know that there are many people around the world who, uh, whose voices are never heard. So we do need political and social leaders and business leaders and religious leaders out there to really prioritize children's needs, especially those basic needs that they need to cover in the first years of their lives. Bueno, en español, sé que la causa del Papa eh, está asociada con la causa de los pobres, pero sabemos que la pobreza es el resulta resultado de la inequidad y la inequidad es el resultado eh, de la falta de oportunidades y todo esto genera violencia. Es que no hay violencia en los países en los que todos reciben eh, igualdad de oportunidades, eh, como por ejemplo los países escandinavos. ¿Por qué no hay violencia allí? ¿Por qué hay, porque hay una igualdad de oportunidades. Y para mí, bueno, y está demostrado también para mis colegas aquí, que, que la educación es esa oportunidad esencial y la más efectiva para poder lograr un mundo en paz, un mundo próspero, económicamente próspero, pero también un mundo estable. Y eso yo creo que es todo lo que queremos. Entonces yo le diría al Papa que también sume, esta, sume su voz a esta causa de la educación, esta causa por los niños, puesto que creo que es fundamental para acabar con la pobreza en el mundo, para erradicarla definitivamente. Ok, I think that that's, um, sorry, but I have received a, a message that the noon brief, the official UN noon brief has to, to start, so we will be taking any questions as UNICEF after that, and, and we will just stick to the message. Eh? Don't just, the world leaders shouldn't be just imagining a world in peace with a fair chance for every child, they should be starting to act and to make sure that that's a reality. Thank you so much for all of you, and sorry for not taking more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. Thank you.